I'm just starting the recording. That way you will have it available to you for future reference. Um, I'm going to do one unit today for sure. And the, today's unit is called, um, we call it the Y Delta connection. Really what we're going to be looking at is understanding the difference between what we call single phase, two phase, and three phase power. And then we're going to look at how we can physically configure an electrical circuit in such a way that it can produce three phase power, or at least we can tap into it to have three phase power available to us. And uh, lastly, what we're going to end up with is going to see, we're going to see in a, a simple electronic circuit that we created for you. And uh, to see how we can transform from one type of configuration, which we typically call a star, to a, another configuration, which we typically call a delta configuration. And this really drives in or prepares you for lab number seven, which you should be doing. Um, I believe it is scheduled for this week, but I'm not 100% sure. So having said that, as a little bit of an introduction, let me share my screen so we can um, go ahead and launch this unit. So just give me a second to open it up mm -hmm. and it should be coming up here. And here is our next unit, which we call Y Delta Transformation and Three Phase Power. So let's have a brief introduction into this, beginning with single phase power. So single phase is the most basic way of providing power. As you can see here from our slide, when we're talking about single phase power, it's a very basic configuration. We typically use a two wire configuration. And of course, when we're talking about single phase, dual phase and three phase power, we are now talking about alternating current. Up to now, we've really been focusing on only DC circuit. And now we're beginning to look at alternating current. So with this single phase two wire physical configuration, typically we have one power wire and one neutral wire. And with single phase power in North America, what we're really talking about is providing 120 volts. This is the standard single phase voltage that is supplied in North America between a single power wire and a neutral wire. So this is the standard for North America. In some other countries, like Europe, for example, they use 230 volts as their single phase power source. And that's why if you're traveling um, between, let's say, Canada and you're going to Europe, you will normally need some type of an adapter if you're bringing your, uh, you know, your small appliances or your computer or whatever it is. And if you're going to be plugging it to their power, you're going to need an adapter because our devices are designed to work with 120 volts. 
But if you go over to Europe, as I just said, their devices are designed to operate with their standard, which is 230 volts. So something important to keep in mind, travel. All right. Um, when it comes to single phase power application, this is typically single phase is typically used for running small appliances, small motors. And we say up to about five horsepower capacity. For larger type applications, which require more power, we will typically switch to two phase or if even more power is required, we switch over to a three phase system. But let's have a look at single phase first and understand it a little bit better. Now we're gonna see more of this when we actually do our unit on AC power or AC current. But just as an introduction, when we look at single phase power, and this is the curve for it, you see that it very much resembles a sine wave. And that's why it is called alternating curve. Because when we saw with DC power, when we set our power supply to a certain voltage level here, this is voltage, all we get is a constant voltage. And this is voltage over time. We get a constant voltage for as long as we keep it on or until we decide to change it. With AC circuits, C power, we see that the power, the voltage, is constantly changing and it looks like a sine wave like this. Now in North America we supply power at a frequency of 60 Hertz which means we get 60 cycles per second. So if we look at this particular graph here we see that this whole cycle, this is one cycle, this is only one cycle, and what we're saying is that in North America, our frequency is 60 hertz. That means we get 60 cycles per second. So we would actually see, if we were to put it on a scope, that there are 60 of these cycles occurring every second. If we look at two-phase power, physically, the configuration requires that we must have an additional wire. So in North America, this is the standard that is used for our household power. The most common arrangement is dual phase power. And here we typically have two power wires and one neutral wire. So altogether, we really have three wires. One power wire for phase A, one power wire for phase B. Relative to neutral. And you can see that they are both, both phases are, are 120 volts. So the interesting thing we should note, and we'll see in our next couple of slides, the two phases, meaning phase A and phase B, are 90 degrees out of phase with one another. 
So one starts earlier and the other one starts later, something like this. And the difference between here and here is 90 degrees. with in-two-phase power. You will see on the next pier that this arrangement, in other words, the dual-phase power arrangement, gives us two sources of 120 volts and one source of 240 volts. And the way that is achieved is by, let's look at the physical configuration for a moment here. So let's say here, this is our, our load here or our resistor. Oops, pardon my poor writing. So you see here that in the physical arrangement, we have one power line, we call it line one, and then a second power line, we call it line two, and we have also a neutral wire. So if we look at, if we connect something, a load between the neutral and line one, there is, we see a different, a potential difference of 120 volts. Likewise, if we were to connect between line two and neutral, we would also have another potential difference of 120 volts. However, if we tap between line one and line two, which are the two power wires, then we would get a total potential difference of 240 volts. So this dual phase gives us a lot more versatility than the single phase. And it also gives us more power if we, should we require more power. So we note it down here for you. This arrangement is used in most households because of its flexibility. We can have the scenario that if we have low power loads, for example, lights, TVs, small appliances, we can power these using either one of the 120 power circuits. If we have higher power loads, for example, like our water heaters in our homes, our AC compressors, our stoves, dryers, these require more power. And if you check your electrical panel at home, you will see that these are using the 240 volt connection. So this is, it would be a typical uh, arrangement of a two phase power. So this, this is a, a simple generator here that gives us two phase power or dual phase power. But the real important thing that we wanna take out of this is that the two phases, phase A and phase B are there is a, they're out of phase with one another, and they're out of phase by 90 degrees. And that's what is shown over here. So one, this one, if we call look at this as phase A, you see that phase A peaks at this point. If we look at the other one, this is phase B here, oops, that's B, you see that this peaks over here. And this is our time axis, let's say, going this way, this is time. So they're out of phase by 
a total of 90 degrees. And that will always be the case for dual phase power. And then comes three phase power. Three phase power is the most common used method that is used by in the electrical grids worldwide to transfer power. So if you think about Toronto itself, how does Toronto get power? Well, there's a, couple, a few ways that Toronto gets power. Power is generated in a number of ways. We know that we have a nuclear plant or more than one nuclear plant. So we have nuclear, nuclear power. We also have power that is generated, as you may know, at Niagara Falls using generators. That is generated by hydro, by water, running over the generator and they generate a lot of power. However, the, what the power is generated, we need to figure out how we can distribute it from, one, from the point where it's created to the point where it is used. And this many times, or oftentimes, this entails transferring power over a long distance. And the most efficient way of transferring power over a long distance is to use a physical configuration of three phase. And that's why we're really, we are talking about it. Now, three phase is typically used for high power applications. And point number two here says, use to power large motors and any really application that requires heavy loads. With three power, three phase power, we typically have a physical configuration that require three power wires, one wire for each of the phases. So we have three phases, phase A, B, and C. And in this case, they are 120 degrees at a face with one another. And in addition to the three power wires, there is also a fourth wire, which is the neutral wire. Let's have a look at what this physical configuration looks like. But before we do that, this is a slide that shows you how the three phases would look. So again, they're all in the form of a sine wave. So you see here in black is phase one. So it, it follows again the shape of a sine wave. And it keeps going. The frequency is also always 60 hertz. And we that so the frequencies doesn't change. The second phase here is shown in the red, as you can see, also resembles a sine curve or a sine shape, as does phase three, which is shown in the blue. The only really difference is when they start and when they finish. And you can see here on the slide that there is a every phase is 120 degrees offset from the previous phase. And these cycles overlap. So note here on the side, there's a couple of comments for you. Three phase power has three distinct wave cycles that overlap with one another. And each phase is 120 degree 
apart from the other. And what that does is really maintain level power throughout. So if you think of an average power in here, it would be somewhere down the middle. We don't need to concern ourselves with that right now. That's not where, what we're focusing on. It's just more of a high level understanding that three, what, of what three phase power involves. <clears throat> and the reason we're going to look at this um, is that we learn more the physical configuration. So three phase power really takes on two major forms, as you can see here on this slide. And the two major forms take on names which are representative of their physical configuration. So we have the first form is what is referred to as a star configuration or a star network, and also commonly referred to as a Y network. So these two are really the same, star or Y. Perhaps the Y is more commonly used. And the other form is the delta configuration, simply because it resembles the shape of a delta. What really is important to us is over here. Whether we see a Y configuration or whether we see a delta configuration, the important thing for us is that we can transform between the two. In other words, we can take a Y and convert it to a delta if we know how to do it. Vice versa, we can take a delta and convert it into a Y. Keep that in mind because, it, because that becomes an important consideration for us. So physically, this is what a Y three-phase power configuration looks like. So here's our Y power circuit right here. You see that it entails a total of four wires. And really, the name Y comes from the way the resistances are physically configured in the circuit. So if we look here, uh, here's our, our loads. So let's say I call this R1, and I'll just call this R2. Oops. And I'll call this one here R3. So you can see that these kind of resemble, this is a center point here, let's call it that. And you can see that this really resemble kind of a Y if you look at it that way. So let me clean that up. But let me put these back here. Let's call this again R1 temporarily, R2 and R3. Now these resistors represent our load. So you see that if I take connect one power wire to one resistor, that's phase A, and if I connect phase B to my other load, and phase C here, the third power wire to the other load in such a configuration. And we have a neutral wire. Let me, let me just do this in better, a little bit better form here. And um, let's do my power wires. Let me just clean this up again. So these are my power wires, A, B, and C. 
These represent our power wires coming into our loads. And our neutral wire, um, I'm not going to use white. I would use white, but it's not going to show up. So let me use black, is over here, tapped right here. And this is our neutral wire over here. So that is a very typical representation of a Y three-phase configuration. Now, what do we get when we do this type of a, of a connection? You see here, it says on the right, we have three live conductors for line A, B, and C, and one neutral. We see what we find is that when we tap from any phase to the neutral wire, we get 120 volts. So if we look at phase A here, and we tap from the phase A wire to the neutral wire, you see we have 120 volts. If we tap between phase B wire and the neutral wire, we get 120 volts. Likewise, if we tap between the phase C wire and the neutral wire, we get 120 volts. If we tap anywhere between any of the two phases that are available to us, so between phase A and phase B, between phase B and phase C, between phase A and phase C, we will get 208 volts. And here you have it. So between, and I'm going to change colors here. Let me use green this time. If I tap between phase A and B, I get 208. If I tap between A and C, I get 208. And if I were to tap between B and C, I get 208. So, and this is what we have down here. One advantage of the three-phase Y configuration is that we have, when we connect phase to neutral, we can have 120 volts on all three phases. So we have three by 120 options, 120 volts. But we also get three 208 options. So this is a very flexible arrangement. So here we have it. Uh, we have uh, this arrangement provides these options for us. And uh, we have power that basically flows between our power wires and the neutral wires. And we also have 208 flowing between the three power wires themselves. So 120 between any phase and the neutral, 208 between any one of the two power wires, if you will. The other option that we have is what is called the delta. Now the delta comes in two options. This one has no neutral wire. 
So this is only a three wire configuration. Now, the, um, it is called the delta. You see the loads here? So this is our one, let's say, our two, our three. You see, they're connected in this kind of a sheet, which we commonly refer to as a delta. And that's why it's called a delta power circuit. So this particular arrangement that we're looking at now has three power wires, but no neutral. So in this configuration, you can see that we get 240 volts between each of the phase combinations. So that's we have down here, if you read, in a standard delta configuration with no neutral, voltage is always face to face. So either between phase A and B, between B and C, or between A and C. Of course, that implies that there is no phase to neutral voltage available. Why this is used and the big advantage of this is right here. The primary advantage of this three-phase delta configuration is a reduction in the number of conductors that are required. And therefore, it is used for long-distance transmission of high-power applications. Very efficient for doing that. Now, if we really needed to have a, th a, a phase to neutral connection in order to get 120 volts in this, you see right now the way it's set up, it's not available. But if we really need to get 120 volts out of this, we can do it by changing the configuration a little bit to look like this. And this one is called a three-phase, a split delta power circuit. So we have to introduce a fourth wire, which is the neutral wire. And you see what happens here? This looks the same as what we had before. We have our three phases, B, A, and C, but we insert the neutral wire and tap it right in the middle of one of the legs so that we can get our 120 supply. Okay, so just keep that in mind as an option. We typically would not do this. We would typically use the Y, but sometimes we have the Delta configuration set up already if we need the 120, we can just add a neutral wire and get the 120. So really, those are the main two configurations that you should consider. So it's either a Y or a delta. And what is interesting to us is how can we move or transform from one configuration to another configuration. And sometimes there is a need to do that. And we'll see one example in your app that you're going to be doing. So to summarize this Y Delta configuration, you I'm going to present this slide here. And you can see the Delta is the general one that we the standard look of the delta is like this. But sometimes it looks like this configuration. 
this is called a high configuration. So you see that the loads are arranged like this, and really that is the same as this. The Y, on the other hand, is here. But the Y can also be represented like this. And this is called the AT configuration. But these two on the bottom here are the more common way that we see things physically. And as I said, we're going to see that we can transform from this to this and vice versa. So let's continue on. And really, here is, well, these are the formulas that you should be aware of. So we can go from the delta to the Y transformation. So if we have a delta here, this is our starting configuration. We can rearrange it to look like this. And all we have to do is get the right values for R1, R2, and R3. And the way we get R1, R2, and R3 is by using these formulas on the left here. So there is a formula for R1. So R1 should be RB, RC, which we get from the left side here. So RB and RC. The product of those divided by the sum of RA, RB, and RC. Likewise, we can get R2 by doing this calculation. This time it would be RA and RC over RA, RB, and RC. And lastly, you would have to calculate the value for R3. by doing the product of RA times RB over the sum of RA plus RB plus RC. You notice that the denominator does not change. These are the same everywhere. The only thing that really changes is the value on top to give us new values for R1, R2, and R3. And if we did this calculation, then these two effectively behave the same. So this is the first transformation. This is, you're starting with a delta, and you want to transfer, transform it to a Y. And clearly, as I said, we can go the opposite way. We can begin with a Y and go to a delta. So in this case, we're beginning with this, and we're going to convert it to this. And in this case, we have to calculate new values for RA, RB, and RC. And you do that by using the equations over here. And that is really it. That's really all you really need to know. Once you know the equations and you know that how these configurations look, then you can go from one to the other and make them equivalent if you need to do that. So why do we even bother with this? And I kind of, uh, this is a slide I've given you for that, is that some resistor networks cannot be simplified using the usual series and parallel rules that we looked at in the first half of our semester. However, this situation can be resolved by using the delta Y transformations. And to get you familiar with that whole idea, we give you this lab to do. 
where you're going to be building a circuit that looks like this. And for the lack of a better term, I call it a pesky bridge problem. What you really have in here is what we often call or refer to is the wheat stone bridge. <clears throat> if we look at circuit, typically what we would do is we would power it with some type of a power source in this manner. So you can see here that the real, really what we have is R1 is a series resistor here, and R7 is also a series resistor here. But these guys are somehow in parallel with this whole network here. This is a, a network. So again, if you were trying to solve this or simplify this using the conventional parallel series analogy that we've done so far, you would see that you would not be, it would not be very simple to solve it. As you would have this guy coming in here, then you're coming down here, this splits this way, this way, but this really is in series in parallel with this combination and this combination. And things get a little bit messy. So we have to figure out a different way to be able to solve this, this bridge. So I'm going to suggest to you how you can go about doing that. And I begin by saying to you, the real problem of the circuit is right here, where we have this configuration. And with this ref configuration, as I said earlier, is known as, referred to as a Wheatstone bridge, which by the way, is a very common bridge used in electrical measurement devices. You will probably see one of these bridges or several of these bridges in your multimeter to help take measurements. So uh, just as a basic introduction, I have here the Wheatstone bridge is an electrical bridge circuit that is used to measure resistance. It was invented by this gentleman, Samuel Hunter Christie, way back. And then it was popularized by Charles Wheatstone. And that's why it's now named or referred to as the Wheatstone Bridge. You can see that it is really contains a network of five resistors. R2 in the middle, and then it has R3, R4 on one side, and R5 and R6 on the other side. This guy is really what we refer to as the bridge resistor here. He's the one that make, keeps things interesting for us. And what we find when we set up this type of bridge is that if the ratio of R3 to R4 is equal to the ratio of the resistance of R5 to R6, then the voltage through R2 equals zero. So remember, 
for this to be true, our, the ratio of R3 to R4 must equal to R5 over R6. So if this is true, this will be true. And by doing this simple kind of a configuration here, we can use this bridge to, as I said earlier, take measurements. So I'm going to help walk you through this to see how you're going to be, you can work to simplify this bridge. Now we actually ask you to build this bridge on your breadboard in lab number seven. We also ask you to use multi-sim to simulate it. And then I, we don't want you to compare your results. What I'm gonna do here is show you the mathematical analyses that you need to use and follow in order to be able to solve this bridge mathematically. So the first thing we want to do here is that we're going to we're going to isolate a part of this bridge. We're going to isolate we're going to break the circuit over here because these are straightforward. This is a, like I said a series resistor and this is another series resistor. So we'll worry about these later. But let's begin by trying to figure out how we can simplify this part of the circuit. The bridge network And to do that, I'm going to kind of challenge your mind a little bit here, is you need to recognize that what we have here is really a delta arrangement of these resistors. And I'm going to use the top quadrant as my starting point. And I'm going to take you back a couple of slides for a moment, just to show you. Um, let me see if I can find it quickly here. Remember this slide? Remember this configuration? It looks like kind of like that. And we said that that really is kind of like that. And if, it, if it's one of these, then we can convert it to one of these. So just keep that in mind. And let me get back to where we were. So we're here. <clears throat> and let's start taking a look at this in a little more detail. So this is where we left off. So we're going to begin by thinking about rearranging the circuit a little bit. So you notice here that R4 remains, R6 remains. We're going to take this top part here which is effectively a delta. And we're going to convert it to a, what looks like a Y or a star. Let to say here Y. This why. Now, on the previous slide, we said we know we can do this, but what will have to happen? We're going to have to find new values for these resistors, for R8, R9, and R10. 
So yes, we can take this and rewire it to look like this. And that's something that an electrician would do, a qualified certified electrician. But in order to be able to do that, we have to change the values for R8, R9, R, and R10. We have to come up with new values. And in order to do that, we said on the previous slides, the value of R8 is given by this. The value of R9 is given by this. And the value of R10 is given by this. So we can now take what we had, this bridge network, and we can rewrite it like this, with new values for R8, R9, and R10, right here. R4 is the same, R6 is the same. No change. All right. Now that we have this new look of the bridge network, can we do anything more with it? Well, now we took away the complexity of the delta configuration. Now we can use the knowledge we learned in the first part of our course. We know how to work with series resistors. We know how to work with parallel resistors. So what do we have at this point? Well, if I look at this, I can, I can redraw this a little bit differently, but I can see that, uh, let me get my marker over here. I can see that R9 and R4 are in series. And I also can see that R8 and R6 are in series. So take a look at that. Make sure you see that. And if that is indeed the case, then I can simply redraw this to make it more visually pleasing, let's say. And now I can clearly see here by doing this little redrawing that clearly these guys are in series. So these are series resistors. And these guys are also series resistors. So if that's the case, and I'm trying to simplify this to a, its simplest form, I know that I can combine these two to give me a new resistor. And if I were to call that Rx, we know that for series in series, we just add them up. So that would be Rx would be R9. plus R4. And that's this guy combined. And if I were to take these guys and combine it, I could say Ry, make it another one, equals R8 plus R six and if i were to do that then i can go one more step and i can say okay if i take these two and i replace them with rx and i take these two and i replace them with ry then I, that's all i'm left with R10 remains over here. I haven't touched it. Now what do we have? Well, I see that Rx, 
Let me get my marker again. Rx and Ry are in parallel. So I can combine these by saying, coming up with a new resistor, And how do I combine parallel resistors? Well, you have to do the reciprocal formula. So I could say if I want to come up with a new resistor, let's say 1 over Rz would equal to 1 over Rx plus 1 over Ry. So you can work all this out. Then you come up with a new value for Rz. And by doing that, you can take these two, combine them in parallel to come up with this. Our tender steel here, we haven't touched that. So what do we have left? If we reintroduce all of the other parts, we had R1, which we didn't touch. We have R7, which we did not touch. And all of that bridge has become R10, which we left, and Rz. So there you go. Your problem is now solved. You can now calculate RT. It would be equal to R1 plus R10. plus Rz plus R7. Once you have Rt, you can start going back and solving all the unknowns. And the place you would begin, if you just go back to the beginning of this, Let's say we go back here. So you're going to be given some kind of a power. You're going to be told to power this up with something. I can't remember if we tell you uh, 9 volts or 12 volts. Since you're doing it at home, I think we've reduced the voltage for you. So there's no risk of uh, causing any problems. But now that you know, the, you would know the total voltage here, whatever it is, and you also know the total resistance. So the first thing you can calculate now is the total current. IT equals VS over RT. And once you know the total current going through here, now you can start figuring out a whole bunch of interesting things going. And you're going to, what you're going to do is um, from here, so the first thing, as I said, you can calculate is IT. And you're going to start using that information and go backwards. So you're going to go to this circuit. And you know that there's a certain amount of current coming through here. This is IT coming through here. So if you know that IT, T is coming through here. Now you can calculate, you know, the, this resistance value. So you can calculate the voltage through here. And then you, and you can calculate the voltage through here. And if you go backward from here, you can start dissecting this. And you can calculate the voltage through here and here. And you keep working backwards all the way. I'm not going to give you the entire solution, because that's what you're going to be really trying to do with your lab. This gives you a good starting point with the analysis of this particular circuit and how you would be able, should be able to solve it analytically. And then when you do your uh, multi-sim uh, simulation, of course, if you do your breadboard correctly and you do this analysis correctly, 
the results that you get from multi-sim should very much emulate what you do mathematically. So this will be an interesting exercise for you in an interesting lab. And um, I believe you should be doing this lab this week, but I'm not 100% sure how far you are with your labs. <clears throat> but uh, this is the information that you will definitely need to be able to work through that, through the lab. So I see that we are just a little bit after 10 o'clock. So what I'd like to do now is um, just um, let's take a quick break. And uh, let's be back. Let's try to be back at it's 9.05, no, 10.05, let's say um, 10, 5, 10, 20 give you 15 minutes. All right, I'm going to stop recording.